guys, today we're back at it again with another list of weird PlayStation import games from my local thrift store. You may recall the last time we took a look at these Japan exclusive games and surprisingly we found a few hidden gems, most notably the timeless classic and my personal favorite, Playing With Yourself. It's easily one of the weirdest games I've ever played and it made me think about all the other unknown games that we never got. What if there's an even better way to spend your free time than playing with yourself just waiting to be discovered? Well, if we're lucky, we might find the answer today. So let's dive in and explore some of the most bizarre, lesser known import titles for the PS1. And at the end of this video, we're gonna rank all the weird games we've talked about so far, so be sure to stick around for that. And without further ado, let's get into it. The first game we'll be looking at today is Love and Destroy, made by the guys at NT Creates, who are now best known for their work in the Mega Man Zero franchise. This title is a 3D mecha action dating sim, which I didn't even know was a genre until now, but to be honest, I kinda liked it. The game is about an alien invasion that wipes out all of humanity, and a group of anime waifus are sent back in time to prevent this from happening, and for some reason they decide to recruit you, just some random dude, to help pilot the mechs and save the world. It's a very tropey anime concept, but I thought it was executed decently enough here. In addition, all the cutscenes are animated very nicely, and I was impressed with some of the aspects of the gameplay. But only some of them. You start each mission off by choosing a character and their corresponding mech. Hmm. The red one is the most agile and playable in my opinion, the green one can fly around and is also pretty decent, and the blue one is super slow and janky, but has really powerful weapons. <laughs> The game was very clearly designed with a DualShock controller in mind, so if you don't play it with the analog control scheme like I did at first because I'm stupid, you're gonna have to control the camera using the shoulder buttons, which felt super clunky and made the game pretty much unplayable. Movement and aiming with the analog sticks on the other hand feels surprisingly smooth for a PS1 game. When you get the hang of the controls, it feels pretty good to move around and shoot down the enemies. However, sometimes the action on screen can happen way faster than you can move the camera, making some missions harder than necessary, and if there are too many things rendering at a time, the game will slow down. But with that said, when it all comes together, it works really well, and the core mechanics can feel pretty solid. The game's biggest issue has more to do with the level design than anything else. The levels can sometimes feel claustrophobic, and the enemies either move way too fast or there are just too many of them, making the whole experience feel unfairly hectic and difficult. The enemies are also massive bullet sponges, it can take a few minutes to kill a single one of them. So your main strategy for every level is going to be to just run around in a circle and hold down the triggers and shoot your enemies until you eventually win. It's really disappointing because I feel like the game truly could have been great if they just made the enemies more manageable and maybe added some more variety to the missions. The game does have its dating sim mechanic to spice things up though, where you can talk to your anime waifus and gain their affection by performing well in each level. But this is where the game's biggest flaw really becomes noticeable. The game is only 3 or 4 levels long, and it took me 45 minutes to beat it, which is just ridiculous. It completely robs you of any chance of developing a real connection with the characters, and it makes the whole experience feel super shallow. At first I thought I must have done something wrong and just got the bad ending or something, but no, it's actually just a really short game. Now there are some secret endings that you can unlock, but it's nowhere near enough to make up for this, and the game really really shot itself in the foot by being so short. I felt like it had a lot of potential and it could have been so much better than it was. With that said though, I did still enjoy the concept and honestly, it made me want to try out some other mech games. I've never played a game like this before, so if you guys have any recommendations, I would love to hear about them in the comments. I'm gonna give this game 3 stars. This next game is developed by Idea Factory, and it has some of the most unsettling cutscenes I've ever seen. There's just something about the PS1 and its jagged, outdated graphics that make horror games from this era so eerie to me, and so I'm pretty excited to check this one out. Uh, well, this is an interesting title screen. <laughs> okay, uh, let's let's just start a new game.
Okay, so after we name our protagonist in what is probably one of the spookiest menus to ever exist in a video game, we're greeted with this wonderful series of cutscenes. Oh, and the game just starts. All right, okay, cool. <laughs> so the game exists as a TV show and a channel run by the developers, and the game is basically a text adventure where the story is told through FMV sequences. The story itself is about a group of friends who go to their now abandoned elementary school to dig up a time capsule that they buried there 10 years ago. They decide to split up and explore the school and, as you can imagine, people start disappearing and spooky things happen. There are monsters, ghosts, and other strange people lurking inside the school and every time something scary happens, the game shows this cutscene of your character screaming. The game also has what it calls the zapping system, where you can switch between the multiple protagonists and experience each character's story simultaneously. It's a neat concept and I thought it was a good way to alleviate some of the repetitiveness that you typically get from having to beat every single character's story in repeated playthroughs. But I think the game's biggest strength is the visuals. It's as if the developers looked at the unintentionally creepy FMV sequences from other PS1 titles and designed the whole game around making them as unsettling as possible. And let me tell you, it works! <laughs> I've never seen a game that looks quite like this. They really nailed the vibe here, and despite its slow pace and simple gameplay, I kept wanting to continue so I could see more of these cutscenes. With that said though, the gameplay definitely leaves a lot to be desired, and it can start to feel repetitive even after just a few scenes. Aside from making a few decisions here and there, it's really not that interactive, and you're mainly just taking the story in. The soundtrack is also not too great, and it mostly consists of just a few simple loops it definitely would have benefited from having some extra content. Now, interestingly enough, the game did have plans for a North American release under the title Misfortune, but it was apparently cancelled because it was too dark and scary. Looking at it now, this might seem a little ridiculous, but believe it or not, this game actually came out before the first Resident Evil released, so scary things hadn't really taken off yet. Overall though, it's definitely a flawed experience, but I still thought it was an interesting look into the past, and I'm glad I checked it out. The limited gameplay makes it a little difficult for me to recommend, and the language barrier might be an issue. Although, the text itself isn't honestly too difficult to read, so if you're someone who's studying Japanese, I could see it being more approachable for you. Sucks. Ah. Next up on our list is And if you're uncultured like me, you'll have no idea who these characters are or why there's even a game like this in the first place. So as it turns out, this game is based on the Japanese rock band Lark on Ciel, who were actually the first Japanese group to headline at Madison Square Garden, so maybe I'm just out of the loop. Anyway, this is a racing game where you pick a character and face off against a single opponent. Instead of a more traditional kart racer, this one has you racing on foot and you'll need to do some platforming to navigate the track. There are a few items you can pick up, and there are also these bounce pads scattered throughout the levels which give you a speed boost if you reach out with the shoulder buttons. You can also use this mechanic to smack your opponent, which I thought was a neat touch. The core movement itself can feel kind of hard to control at times though, especially in corners, and you'll be wrestling with the controller to try and navigate the tight tracks. It also doesn't help that the camera is so close to the character. Visually though, I thought it looked pretty nice. Everything is very crisp and colorful, and I like the way the character models looked. Each member of the band also voices their own character, and some of their music appears in the game, which is pretty good to see, you know, since the band's name is on the box. I'm looking at you, Jeremy McGrath Supercross 2000 featuring music by The Offspring that doesn't actually have music by The Offspring. <laughs> The weirdest thing about this game to me is the fact that there's no championship mode or way of doing multiple races in a series. You can only play one-off exhibition matches, which you can imagine gets old pretty quick. There's also this game mode where you play this flag-waving Simon Says minigame, and if you do it 50 times you can unlock the next challenge. I'm assuming this is how you unlock more tracks in the game, but this minigame was just so boring I couldn't be bothered to continue after losing a couple of times. <laughs> 
白下げて赤上げて危ない伏せろ There's also this spectator mode where you can cheer on the AI and affect the outcome of the race by clapping more. It's honestly a weird choice for a game mode, and I feel like it really has no reason to be here. And that's the whole game. It's pretty bare bones as a racing game, and in my opinion, it lacks a lot of the variety needed to be a fun experience for more than a few matches. I feel like, unless you're a diehard fan of the band, you can do without giving this one a try. Two stars. Okay, switching things up a bit, this next game is called Harmful Park, High Brow Gag and Shooting, and it's a lot more import friendly than the others thanks to an English patch you can get online. This game is a side scrolling shooter made by Skythink System, and it's a very rare and highly collectible game for the original PlayStation due to its limited print run. The story takes place in Heartful Park, and it gets taken over by a rogue scientist named Dr. Tequila, who makes all the machines and equipment go berserk. The other scientists have no idea what to do about the situation until this lady recruits her two daughters to lead the fight and save the day. Right off the bat, the artwork in this game is beautiful, especially in the cutscenes. The character sprites are so colorful and stylish, and the game overall has a very high level of polish. Gameplay wise, it's a typical side scrolling shooter where you're bombarded with waves of amusement park themed enemies. You also have a variety of weapons at your disposal, like jelly beans, ice cream, french fries, and pie, and each one has its own strengths and weaknesses. They all start off feeling pretty basic, but you can level them up by grabbing power ups and changing weapons depending on the situation. Feels really satisfying. The game can be quite hectic at times, like most shooters, but I thought it was very forgiving and it has multiple difficulties for you to choose from. There are six stages in total, with a boss battle at the end of each one. Some of the bosses are really interesting, like this inflatable dinosaur or the big lady who reveals her face after you defeat her. <coughs> But one of my favorite scenes in the game was this wedding sequence where a couple are about to get married when suddenly another guy bursts through the door and the bride runs off with him, and the groom's tears become projectiles that you have to avoid hitting. It's such a cool idea to weave a cutscene like this into the core gameplay, and the developers pulled it off very nicely. This game has such a high level of charm, and I was very impressed with it. The soundtrack is also really good and it's very dynamic. It often changes genres completely depending on what stage you're on and who you're fighting. Park also supports cooperative play with a friend, but I couldn't get a lot of footage with that since I don't have any. It also has a few mini games to mix things up. There's Punch Ball, which is basically Pong, Sky Circuit, which turns the movement into racing mechanics, and Tank Battle, which for some reason looks completely different than the rest of the game and can be played with up to four players. But I'm still really glad the developers added them in here, it, it's a nice touch. Overall, this game has a lot of variety, charm, and it's really fun, and you can play it in English. Now, I don't give many games a perfect score, in fact, I don't think I've ever given a single game in any of my videos a 5 star rating, but honestly, I feel like I have to give it to this one. It represents a lot of the things that I love about video games, and as an import title, I have every reason to recommend it to you guys. So with that said, this game is top quality beef steaks. Whoa! And with that, I can proudly say we found our new champion of the weird Japanese video game series, with Harmful Park taking the number one spot. And if we look at the other games I've reviewed on this channel so far, including PS2 games and a few others, we'd have Gregory Horror Show in second place, followed very closely by Planet Laika. Then we've got Zoku Segare Ijiri, Mega Man Legends 2 Episode 1, which was the Japan exclusive demo for Mega Man Legends 2 that marketed itself as a separate video game and Boku Achi Sai rounding out the third bracket. As far as middle of the road average games go, I think Doshin the Giant, Segare Ijiri, and Ski Jumping pairs all belong here. 
and I think Kowloon's Gate was probably the most interesting of the worst games, followed by Miniskirt Police and Love and Destroy. In the E tier, we've got Yakuyu Jodangi, Super Adventure Rockman, Toma Runner, and Petten TV. And as for the bottom of the barrel games down in F tier, we've got Wily and Light's Rockboard and The Taidyo Jigoku. If any of you are thinking you would rank it differently yourself, uh, let me know what your thoughts are, but for now, I think this is a pretty good list. Now my main idea with this is to organize all of the Japan exclusive titles so you guys can use it as a resource if you decide to play any of them yourself or you're thinking about importing them. And with that said, I really had a lot of fun checking out these games with you today. We still have a lot of weird games to go through, including a few that didn't make it into this video, so if you want to see more, be sure to subscribe and leave a like, comment, and share this video. And if you have any recommendations for games to talk about in the next video, I'd love to hear them. So thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.